Good morning, everyone. My name's Liam. I'm a consultant with Marshall Day Acoustics in Melbourne, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar on the design on fly towers and overstage machinery. This is the third in a series of talks from Marshall Day regarding performing arts facilities. And if you have any questions throughout today's webinar, then please write them in the Q&A panel, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. I'll be monitoring this throughout the talk and we'll answer any questions at the end. So it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Micah Johnson. Micah Johnson is the design leader of Marshall Day Entertech and has over 15 years experience of designing and implementing systems across performing arts and construction industries. His career began in the early 2000s, working as a lighting technician and automation engineer for theatrical productions and quickly moved into managing tours and shows alongside working as a designer and technician. As part of that work, he toured productions across Australia, gaining familiarity with the majority of the major performing arts facility uh, venues across Australia. During this time, he was involved in such varied projects as The Big Day Out, Disney on Ice, and worked with theatre companies such as Bell Shakespeare and the Griffin Theatre Company, as well as a host of independent theatre companies. After some time as an engineer outside of live performance, in 2016, Micah moved to Melbourne to work with Marshall Day in designing presentation venues and their technical systems, with recent project highlights, including the Sydney Coliseum, Sky City Convention Centre in Auckland, and the Alexander Theatre at Monash University. And so without further ado, over to you, Micah. Uh, thanks, Liam. Uh, thanks for, for the introduction. Hi, everybody, and thanks for coming along this morning. I hope you find today's talk useful. Um, I've had many conversations over the years with venue owners and with architects about fly towers uh, and about what they need to think about uh, to make some of the high level early decisions when it comes to stage rigging. Often these conversations take place when a certain amount of planning and design has already happened. And sometimes that needs to be rethought once some of the things I talk about uh, today come into play. So what I'm hoping will be helpful is to give you guys an understanding um, of firstly what a fly tower is and what it's used for. Um, then I'll talk about the fundamental forms that a fly tower can take on um, in different projects. I'll, I'll run through what kinds of machinery uh, we put inside so you can see how we actually fly things. Um, and for each of those uh, points, I'll, I'll give some information on what the implications might be for uh, the rest of the project. Hopefully, uh, once we've been through each of these things, you can, you can go away with a clear picture of what you need to think about regarding fly towers and rigging um, before the design process gets too far along. If there is anything you'd like more info on as I'm working my way through, as Liam said, he'll be able to moderate some questions that I, I will have time to answer at, at the end of the talk. Uh, okay, so we have a pretty varied audience here this morning. And often when people come to us asking for a fly tower in a venue, they can have some pretty varied ideas of exactly what that might mean. So to make sure we're on the same page, I'm just gonna quickly run over what we do mean when we're talking about a fly tower and, and what the major parts of it are. So here we have our, our theater. Uh, we have the auditorium where the audience sits, we have the stage, uh, we have the proscenium, which not all theatres have, of course, but I'll touch on that a little later. Uh, we have the stage house, which includes uh, the stage itself, the wings, possibly a rear stage, and the fly tower, which is, of course, the tower um, above the stage house. If we have a quick look from another angle, we can see the main components inside the fly tower. Now, you won't necessarily need all of these things I'm gonna go through, but I'll illustrate them with a fairly common configuration. Um, so we'll generally have at least one gallery uh, just above the height of the proscenium opening. This gallery might be used for uh, patching and hanging lighting fixtures, possibly for loading counterweights uh, and manipulating uh, hung scenery. Sometimes additional galleries are included above this one for loading counterweights. Um, so a loading gallery that's used only for loading and unloading counterweights can look uh, a bit like this one. You can see the ropes from the counterweight system there to the left. The stage itself uh, is below to, to the right. I, I will explain how the counterweights work a little um, later on. Um, 
but a, a gallery could be used uh, for counterweights like this one, or it could be used for electrics um, like this one here. This is the same theatre as, as we were just looking at on the opposite side of the stage. And what we can see here is the, the power and control wiring that runs from this gallery um, up over the top of the stage and, and to the lighting bars to provide a overhead lighting. Now, in the theatre shown here, uh, as well as in the model we're looking at, uh, the technical gallery spans both sides of the stage and as well as running it across the back of the stage, providing a crossover. Um, if you need to, it's, it's fairly common for theatres to forego that crossover um, or to have the crossover outside the stage house itself um, so that you're not taking up as much room and so you have a clearer back wall to the stage. Um, I've only shown one gallery here, but like I mentioned, depending on how your rigging is set up, you're likely to need, need at least uh, one more gallery higher up the tower. And above those galleries, at the very top of the tower, the fly grid. Um, the fly grid spans the stage area and it allows crew to walk around, uh, lets them mount and work on rigging at height without being dependent on height access equipment. Um, so the grid's made up of a series of parallel beams uh, that can be walked on um, and can have items fixed to them, but that can also be easily penetrated by steel wire rope or the chains that we're hanging flown items from. Now, these used to be uh, always made of timber, uh, and in New Zealand, uh, they're often still made of timber. However, in Australia, our BCA... Uh, requires the beams to be uh, of a non-combustible material, which essentially means in new venues at least, these are going to be made out of steel. Um, so the grid enables the theatre crew to, to drop a suspension line essentially anywhere over the stage. Um, so they have complete flexibility um, and they can give whatever is needed to theatrical designers and directors. You can see um, one method of doing that here. Um, this is a chain hoist on a rigging frame. Um, if you look at the mounting of the frame, you can see that the base uh, spare, spans several of the grid beams, um, dispersing load across them, uh, allowing us to have a much greater point load than we might otherwise be able to have. Um, so looking at the grid from underneath, um, you, you can uh, see where each of the fly lines penetrate to allow the battens to be hung below. And um, in this image, you can also see our rear crossover galleries to, to the left. Nowadays, um, usually above the grid, are the beams that support the fly system and allow us to uh, fly things up and down. Um, now, there are a few ways that this flying or movement of suspended items can be achieved. Um, primarily, they're, they're either counterweighted and manipulated by hand or they're driven by hoists of some kind. And once we've covered a bit more about the, uh, the fly tower itself, I will delve into each of these methods when I talk about the kinds of rigging we might install in our tower. Um, but now we have a reasonable idea of what we're talking about when we say the word fly tower, um, we can discuss what the main parameters are that we can play with to get the fly tower we need. Uh, the type of machinery we install in the tower, that's one of the parameters. Um, and the other parameter mainly is the size and shape of the tower itself. But before we talk about either of those things, we do need to discuss uh, exactly what it is we're trying to achieve with our rigging. Um, so it's pretty clear from what we've been through already that generally the fly tower is used to hold things above the stage and to move things in and out of sight. But it's not always necessary to do both of these things and each of them can be done in different ways depending on exactly what you need. So let's take a look. Uh, a whole range of things can, uh, that might need to be suspended. Um, I've got just a few examples here. Um, we might uh, be moving these things in and out of sight. Um, and if we do move them in and out of sight, 
we'll need to think about how big they are um, so that we can move them completely out of view. Apart from moving them in and out of sight, we may or may not need to move them around when they're in sight. Um, in that case, we will need to nail down uh, what we expect our needs are going to be with regard to how fast, how heavy, uh, and how complicated uh, the movements might need to be. Now, if you're an architect, uh, which many of you are, or a business manager, you, you're probably thinking right now you, you aren't really going to have an answer to any of these questions, which is fair enough. Um, you might be lucky enough to have an informed client who can provide some, some clear requirements, but if not, this is probably an area that, depending on the project, could do with some closer examination. Um, there are some broad brush stroke assumptions you can use as a starting point, though, and I, I'll promise you I'll, I'll go through them a little further on. In the meanwhile, uh, it's worth noting that at this point, each of the requirements I've shown here are mainly about what you can see. And I haven't talked much about what you can hear. This is because a fly tower doesn't really help things sound better. Uh, and it can often make things, uh, make it harder uh, to get good acoustics in a room. I'll touch briefly on, on recital and, and concert halls a little later, but today I'll mainly be talking about the visual effects of fly towers and machinery. Um, and these are most relevant to theatrical performances as opposed to purely musical performances. Now, having said that, you can help alleviate the effects of a fly tower on acoustics by using what I've shown here, um, an orchestra shell. This is basically a series of acoustic reflectors that, that create a temporary room, if you like, within the fly tower. Um, that removes the effects of the gaping uh, space above the musicians and allows them to receive their early reflections from their own instruments. Uh, there's another shot here that shows a little more clearly uh, the reflector panels that make up the shell. But um, beyond the physical needs we've been over, there are a couple of specific operational needs that can influence our design requirements. Um, we might, for example, need to accommodate uh, shows that were originally staged elsewhere. And as many of you uh, come from or are working in an educational environment, we might need to think about training students for work in a, in a professional theatre once they leave. Um, these two points are similar um, and they're worth a, a quick discussion up front. Um, for both of these uses, how other theatres operate is, is the main concern. If you're receiving shows from, from elsewhere, uh, then there may be no choice but to make the machinery available that these shows are used to. For commercial musicals, one of the more demanding types of touring production, this essentially means you will need to have a fly tower, a full fly tower, uh, and you'll have additional constraints on, on the size of capa and capacity of the tower, um, along with constraints on, on the rest of the building as well. For training purposes, um, if, for example, the venue is at a tertiary technical school, um, the client may want students to have experience on both counterweight and motorised systems. Uh, so different venues may be built with each system or they both might be included side by side in a single room. And, and the same could go for, for motorised systems at different levels of complexity. So really, these, these two uses uh, just help determine our first three requirements. Um, so we can go back to talking about those needs. Now, we can assume that any stage rigging that we build will have some capacity to suspend loads. Um, and we can assume that we'll need to. Any type of performance, whether it's uh, music or dance or drama or just a simple speech, will at least call uh, for lights to be rigged above the stage. Um, and although there will need to be design regarding what loads a building and the system can take, um, how to fix the loads and how to access the fixing points, uh, for the sake of this discussion, if there is to be any rigging over stage at all, we can assume that that first need uh, will be met, which, which leaves us with two remaining requirements, and the first of which will be the main driver on... The, uh, the size and shape of the flight tower itself. 
So the model we've been looking at so far shows us our, our house curtain uh, and a full height set piece, both being flown right out of sight of the audience. This is a pretty common need and it demonstrates clearly when and why you'll need a full height or a full drift fly tower. So uh, what exactly does this mean in terms of how high the tower needs to be? Well, there are some very rough uh, rules of thumb and I've put some just some example numbers in here. Intuitively, you might think that you just need a tower twice as high as, as the proscenium opening so you can fly something the same size somewhere else. Um, but in fact, uh, the tower needs to be considerably higher than that to be full drift. Um, set items, for example, could be, uh, you know, at least a couple of metres higher than the proscenium um, so that an audience member sitting on the ground, say in the front row, uh, can't see up and over the top of, of those set pieces. And there'll need to be space above the flown out items um, for the rigging itself, uh, for the grid and for various uh, fixings. So these numbers can change um, depending on the depth of the stage, where the audience is sitting and a few other things. But as, as a general rule of thumb, um, just really a starting point, the fly tower will need to be about two and a half times the height of the proscenium itself. Um, so if your venue is of any considerable size, um, this means you'll need to construct uh, the galleries, a few galleries and the grid that we looked at earlier. And this is traditionally what we would call uh, a fly tower. It's what we see installed in opera theatres, uh, lyric theatres and, and other proscenium arch theatres across the world. This sort of facility allows stage sets to be quickly and seam seamlessly changed from one scene to another and it gives them somewhere to go that isn't taking up valuable space in the wings or elsewhere on stage. Um, touring productions, operas, musicals, and uh, more complex dramas, all of these may require a tower like this. And this is the reason, this tower is the reason that we see such dramatic architecture in, in some of our venues, uh, like opera houses, I'm sure you recognise that one, uh, as well as in professional lyric theatres. This is a Sydney Coliseum um, you can see the fly tower under construction there um, and then once it's complete that's the fly tower on the left uh, and you'll also see uh, fly towers in, in much smaller regional performing arts centres um, like the West Gippsland Arts Centre here. So that's a full flight, full height uh, fly tower um, but, but a full tower might not be exactly what someone is thinking of when they ask for a fly tower. And it isn't the only solution to moving and suspending things over stage. Um, you might, for example, only need to lift the things I've got listed here. Um, if you're only moving smaller items, then you don't necessarily need the full height of a traditional tower um, and all of the galleries and, and grid and access that come along with it. You might only need a smaller loft um, without a tower. Um, if you've got an arrangement like this, for example, your house curtain can be opened to the side on a track and smaller items can still be flown in and out. Um, that can be, uh, this arrangement can be uh, for a smaller venue, but it can also be appropriate in uh, larger spaces, for example, uh, possibly in a convention centre or a function space where full backdrops won't need to be flown out of out of sight, but you may still have a requirement to fly uh, large or heavy things in and out that just aren't physically as tall. Um, so alternatively, if the proscenium opening is low, even with the smaller construction without a full uh, tower, um, items may be able to be flown completely out of sight. This is um, appropriate often for an intimate drama theatre, um, such as the drama theatre at the Sydney Opera House. Uh, this room stages uh, some of the most prestigious dramatic shows that come to Australia or that are produced here. Um, and as you can see from this shot, it has quite a wide and low uh, proscenium. If we look inside the fly gallery there, it's clear that there's enough height um, 
to fly those the shorter sets out, um, but there's no fly grid. Um, so they can save a considerable amount of height there. This room is about the limit of, of the height where this sort of hybrid is likely to work and still be able to fly sets fully out. Because if you look at the section uh, here, you can see that um, where the rigging is up here, this is about uh, 10 metres from the stage. So it's low enough to uh, access with a scissor lift for maintenance or to do adjustments and additions to the rigging above. Um, but because the proscenium is only a bit over five metres, there's still enough height even in here to fly a drape or a set uh, completely out of sight of the audience. Now, uh, if the proscenium arch is, is any higher or the structure itself is any lower, then uh, the room will begin to look like what you might find in many uh, high schools and community centres and halls, um, which is an arrangement without any tower as such at all, but still uh, some of the functionality uh, that a fly tower provides. So here's a pretty good example of what I'm talking about here. This is a high school on the outskirts of Melbourne. You can see a, a technical gallery there with some lighting equipment. And you can see above that there definitely isn't enough room to fly out a curtain or a full set, but certainly our lighting bars, um, our microphones and smaller items can be suspended above without being inside of the audience. Now, it might be possible to fly very small items in and out here, um, but generally this type of stage, um, the rigging will be used to hang things statically, like backdrops or banners um, or the lighting and, and drapery. There, there's still usually a need for moving rigging, um, but generally the movement can take place when the audience can't see the stage, um, such as during show setup or for maintenance, which means that it can be a, a much uh, slower, cheaper and safer kind of system. So to recap, the, the three main fly tower forms we've looked at is that the full fly tower, where you can uh, fly full sets in and out. The hybrid, where smaller items or, or shorter sets can be flown in and out, or no tower at all. Now, each has their place, um, and each can provide flying functionality of some kind. Um, but there's a couple of things I haven't mentioned. Um, earlier on, I promised I would touch on theatres without a proscenium and on musical performances. So I won't say a lot here because it's a bit of a uh, sidetrack, but essentially, if you're building a room that will primarily be for musical performances, um, a fly tower will often be more of a hindrance than a help. Um, and by this, I mean, I mean concert halls and I mean uh, recital halls, which rarely have fly towers. In these spaces, an open area above the stage can be detrimental to the acoustics, which is, of course, uh, very important for musical performances. Now, and even if you are doing complex dramatic shows, you can actually achieve a lot uh, without a fly tower at all by using temporary masking, um, possibly drapery, like, like we can see here, um, or simply allowing darkness to mask what's above the stage. This is from a production of A Midsummer Night's Dream uh, at the Bridge Theatre in London. Um, now, so I, I said before I'd give you some idea of where different performances might sit and what their needs might be and what we've spoken about. Um, and some of that's listed here from what we've already discussed. This is, of course, very rough, uh, but I hope it can give you a sense of where you might stand, even if you aren't familiar with what goes on backstage during various types of shows. So, so very broadly, um, opera, major touring productions and commercial musicals, um, they will need a fly tower. Um, if you're only doing drama or, or dance, um, depending on the complexity of your shows and the scale of your shows, you might, you might need to be able to use one of the smaller lots. Um, and the most intimate shows where you might only think, need things hung statically may not require any tower at all. And even without a tower, you can, uh, you can achieve quite a lot with just temporary masking in some, in some circumstances. Okay, so we know whether we can hide things. Um, 
the next use of stage rigging is to make things move around when people can see them. Um, and it's our capacity to move things around when they're in sight that uh, is dependent on the type of machinery that goes into the tower. You might be thinking at this point that the type of rigging in the tower um, could be changed or, or decided on later in the design process. And sometimes it can, but uh, what freedom you have in those choices will depend still on design decisions that, that are made early on. So why? Why do we need to look at this uh, so early, uh, as early as possible during the planning of our new venue or our venue upgrades? Well, primarily for three reasons, because each of the different machinery forms takes up physical space uh, and they each take up a different amount of physical space in, in different places. Uh, but also because each of them puts different structural loads on the building and maybe less critical at early planning, but still important to consider um, the forms, of course, have different power requirements. <clears throat> so without at least considering the options early on, uh, you may unwittingly force yourself into a solution that isn't the best for your project. So what options do we, do we have? Well, we've got fixed rigging or dead hung rigging. Uh, we've got directly hung rigging and we've got diverted rigging. I don't have time to dig really deeply into the advantages of each approach, but I can provide an overview of what the impacts might be on the rest of the building. So you can be prepared for what might be needed. So first up, fixed rigging. It's pretty simple. Um, it's plainly clear what the needs are, so we don't need to talk about it much. We're just talking about uh, the capacity for items to be statically suspended from the building structure. All we really need is accessible fixing points and structural capacity. Uh, but if flexible uh, rigging locations are needed, as is the case over a stage area, um, a grid pattern of steel pipe would usually be installed. Uh, you can see that, hopefully you can see the pipe running in the ceiling of this studio space. Um, this is commonly referred to as a fixed pipe grid. Um, and in the, it allows lighting and, and speakers to be hung anywhere you like over the stage area. Um, our directly hung rigging places similar requirements on the building itself. And this is where motorised loads are directly connected to the structure. Um, the hoists themselves could be stationary and placed at, at the top, like, like these chain hoists I've shown here, just to give you a better idea of what a chain hoist is and how it works. Um, this image isn't very pretty, but hopefully it shows what I'm talking about. Um, the block in the centre here is, is the hoist itself. Uh, it's hooked onto a, to a cleat uh, to the structure above, and the load will be suspended to this hook via the chain, which will feed in and out of the bag through the hoist to raise and lower. Um, so as you can see, that's, that's hooked to the structure and the load moves beneath. Alternatively, uh, the chain hoist could be hung uh, affixed to the load so that the hoist flies up and down. Uh, there are a few different ways of doing this, um, self-climbing hoists. Um, sometimes this is used for a permanent install, but uh, it's much more common for temporary rigging like the one you can see here. And either way you go, uh, the loads on the building will be vertical uh, like the little red arrows I've shown there. So the requirements this places on the building, like I said, are pretty similar to dead hung loads with the addition of some dynamic forces from when the, the load is speeding up or slowing down. And of course, a little bit of power. So more complex than this, uh, but also much more flexible is a rigging system that uses steel wire rope and diverter pulleys to transfer, transfer the load to another location. Uh, so this means you can run your lines to a counterweight or a crank or to a winch and all the points on a single line, which is uh, how we refer to the whole unit together, they can be manipulated in sync. Uh, systems like this can be operated much more quickly generally than, than chain hoists or a self-climbing system. Um, and they do so with greater control at variable speeds. Um, the large and, and noisy winches, if, they, if they're large and noisy, can be placed in a separate room so they can't be heard by the audience. 
and also so they don't take up valuable space in the galleries. These systems do place a much greater and more complex load on the building structure uh, with reactant forces everywhere that the lines are, are diverted, as you can see uh, in our image there. So uh, just to give you an idea what that looks like, you can see here diverter pulleys tra transferring a load across fly grid there uh, into a head block and down to some drum hoists. So the, the vast majority of theatrical rigging is, is achieved in this way, at least for permanent installations. And if a theatre is to have a full fly tower, this is the kind of system that will be required, whether it's motorised or not. So the only remaining point to cover relates to these diverted systems and how they're driven. In terms of the effect on the building, uh, this is a choice basically between a counterweighted system or a non-counterweighted system. So in a counterweighted system, a number of weights that match the suspended load are attached to the opposite end of the suspension line. So the system is roughly in balance. So this weight here uh, will weigh about the same as the load up here. Once it's in balance, then the load can be manipulated by hand. Uh, without those counterweights, as we can see on the right, the entire weight of the suspended load has to be carried by whatever's placed at the end of the suspension line. This is generally a winch of some kind, um, as you can show here, and for today's discussion, we'll, we will assume it's a winch. So let's compare these two directly. Firstly, you can see from these images that the counterweight system simply takes up a very large amount of room. Uh, unless you employ one of a number of tricks um, that each make the system much more difficult to operate, you will essentially need to reserve one entire wall of the stage house from top to bottom in order to house the fly systems. So that whole grey area there will basically be taken up by the counterweight fly system. In contrast to this, uh, the space taken up by a motorised system on the right um, is much smaller. You do need to house the hoist somewhere, of course, um, and sometimes they need to be in a room that's acoustically isolated from the stage. But as you can see in the image on the right, not having the fly wall can open up the whole side of that stage to be used as wing space or access to perhaps an adjacent dock or, or workshop. Uh, and that, that can make a big difference. So apart from this dramatic difference, um, what else have we got? Well, both these systems are inherently dangerous uh, and they both have to be operated by someone who's trained in their use. Operating a counterweight system is a specific skill. Um, and as, as more motorized systems are installed, finding good fly crew uh, is getting is getting harder to do, particularly if uh, your venue's not in a major city, a major centre, finding operators could be a problem. Um, now, while complex automated systems are, of course, dangerous, and there's a school of thought that they're more dangerous than counterweights, um, a simple motorised hoist system can be installed that, for example, operates slowly, um, it, it might not be intended for live flying during a show, and this type of rigging uh, can be used with only fairly basic safety training. You could get a, a school teacher easily to, to operate a system like that. Um, so next up, a counterweight system needs a flywall, as we've seen, to house the cradles and ropes associated with each line, generally taking up the entire wall of a stage house. Motorised system doesn't need nearly as much space. If it's a large system, um, the hoists may be noisy and need to be housed in a dedicated room. But if it's a small system, uh, those hoists can just be fixed directly to the, to the ceiling beams. A uh, counterweight system will need several loading galleries, um, so the system can be balanced when the load's at different heights, uh, whereas a motorised system uh, will just need somewhere to operate from that has a good view of, of all the, uh, the stage area, possibly just the one gallery. Um, complex cues. For a counterweight system, cues have to be rehearsed uh, and then reproduced if they're complex by skilled operators. A live uh, control system for a motorised 
uh, automated hoists uh, can have cues recorded digitally uh, so they can be reproduced exactly. Um, this brings its own safety considerations, but it, it does mean that uh, it can be complex interaction between different lines uh, and you can be confident that each show will be reproduced in the same way. Uh, and finally, what if, if not planned for early can unfortunately be a, a deciding factor uh, is that a large motorised system, if it's to be fully automated um, and capable of carrying out all the same complex cues that a counterweight system might, can easily cost uh, 10 times what an equivalent counterweight system would cost. But stage machinery is a major part of a performing arts facility. Um, for a new build, this sort of system will really cost, you know, more than 5% or so of, of construction. Um, now, this can be obviously a huge problem if it's not planned for early, um, but if it's factored in right from the beginning, it's not, not nearly as much of an issue. So, thank you for your time so far today. Uh, I hope you found uh, what I've said engaging and informative. Now you've got a clear idea of the options and the primary considerations. I'll just leave you with a summary of the main points to take away. So when you're thinking about the implications of a fly tower and overstage rigging in your venue, here are the questions you need to ask yourself. Firstly, do I need a fly tower? And what kind of fly tower do I need? This is determined basically by what, if anything, you want to fly out of sight. If you're only doing acoustic musical performances, you won't necessarily need or even want a fly tower. Uh, on the other hand, if you're staging operas or toured musicals, you almost definitely will. And drama and dance can fall sort of anywhere in between. Uh, secondly, what sort of machinery, what sort of rigging do we need? Even before cost is considered, there are uh, strong opinions either way regarding the safety of each of the options. And no matter which way you go, uh, who will be available to operate the system will come into play pretty quickly. Of course, the, count, uh, the space taken up by counterweights is considerable and more complex shows, uh, well, they can only be run on counterweights or on the most expensive mechanised systems. So I hope that was clear enough um, and I hope it, it gave you guys a, a good foundation uh, for fly towers and stage machinery. I'll pass back to Liam now who can put through any questions you might have. Absolutely. Thanks for that, Micah. So I'll remind everyone to yeah, put those questions down into the Q&A panel at the bottom if you have them. Um, hey, Micah, one question that came through was you spoke briefly about crew and training... Uh, Sorry, you spoke briefly about how the crew and the training needed for the crew to run a counterweight system um, and mentioned briefly that some people think the automated system is actually more dangerous. Can you explain why that might be the case? Uh, yeah, yeah, this is, it's a bit of a, uh, there's, there's strong opinions either way on this, on this issue. Um, and a lot of the time it does boil down to, to the training and also to what kind of system that you have. If you're running an automated system, um, it is possible theoretically to program in a series of cues uh, to press the go button. Um, I mean, they have dead man buttons that mean you have to actually be holding a button down for them to run. But it is possible just to run the cue and disengage from the process um, so that something could fly into someone without without you really being aware of what's going on. The counterweight system, on the other hand, uh, somebody needs to be physically manipulating the fly line or at least starting it at moving. Um, and there's a much more visceral engagement with the, with the motion. Uh, and some people think that that's, uh, that means that, that someone's paying much more attention and it's safer in that way. Nowadays, uh, there are a huge amount of safety uh, systems that can be put into an automated um, control system that make it a lot safer, um, and it is possible to lock them out, whereas a counterweight system, unless it's physically locked away, which is pretty difficult to do, um, it, it is possible for someone to come on and operate it thinking they know what they're doing uh, when they don't, and an imbalanced line can, can quickly pick up speed and crash to the ground without people knowing. So it's still a question of the safety uh, 
uh, the safety systems that you put in to, to a system and, and who's operating it. And what would be the rule of thumb for the kind of difference in the size of the crews required for those two uh, different systems? Uh, well, theoretically, I mean, you only need one person to operate um, a fly system of either kind. If you're running a counterweight system uh, and you, you're running different lines simultaneously, then you really need one person to run each line simultaneously. Um, in a motorised system, in theory, again, you could run, you know, 100 lines just from a single person, which, you know, you can sort of see the, the safety concerns that are brought about by doing that. Um, for that reason, on, on the more complex systems, you know, you can lock out certain lines to be only run from certain locations um, and operationally um, a system will have spotters and, and, and detectors and making sure that that's safe. But that does need to be... Uh, programmed into the system. Um, if you're talking about that sort of concern, though, you're really talking about a pretty high-end, pretty complex um, arrangement that you, you're not going to have someone walking in off the street trying to trying to run that. Mm, yeah. Okay. Well, Micah, thanks so much. Um, that wraps up the questions that have come through so far. But of course, if ever, anyone has any other questions, naturally, and they want to get into contact, all of our details and your details, of course, are on our website. Um, do you have anything else to add, Micah? Just uh, thanks for coming along. Um, if, uh, yeah, if you've got any questions, feel free, free to, to send them through um, and hopefully I can chat to you all again soon. Absolutely. Thank you all very much for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your days. Okay, see you later.